Hello, my name is Nikolai Yusupov. I'm a certified critical care paramedic in New York City. And in this presentation, I'd like to talk to you about invasive mechanical ventilation made very easy. And if you go to my website, criticalcareift.org, I'll post all the notes as well as links to all the manuals mentioned here. And you could leave me questions and comments regarding this presentation. In addition, if you go to my YouTube channel and post your questions and comments, and also subscribe to the channel, this way I'll know I'll have viewers actually watching my content, that would be greatly appreciated. As a new provider, whenever you delve into the world of critical care transport, a ventilator is always the tough piece of the puzzle for you to learn. And whenever you start out, you always picture ventilators that look like something at the top. However, whenever you encounter a real life ventilator, they always end up looking like the one at the bottom. And you're always left bewildered and confused as far as what all those dials, switches, and knobs really do. And you never really understand the core fundamental principles that govern mechanical ventilation. And in this presentation, I want to talk about the principles that govern uh, mechanical ventilation. And principles are king. And if you understand the fundamental principles uh, behind mechanical ventilation, you don't really have to remember specific switches and dials. Uh, because if you understand the core principles, you could really integrate any type of ventilator and suit the needs of your patient. To illustrate why I think principles are king and not the ventilator brands, I want to use the following example. During your paramedic school, most of you probably have been taught on life pack 12, how to perform 12 lead EKGs, how to pace somebody, perform synchronized cardioversion, and defibrillation. They explain to you the fundamental principles behind these electrical therapies. You've been tested on them. However, whenever you graduate and you find employment, the employer may have all different brands of monitors. They may have a Zoll, they may have a Philips, they may have a life pack. However, during your in-service, all I have to do is really show you the specific buttons on that monitor brand. However, you have the principles that govern all these electrical therapies under your belt. So I don't have to spend a great deal of time explaining to you why am I performing synchronized cardioversion, why am I running 12 EDKG, because you have all those things under your belt. So if you had a patient who you clearly identified had unstable dysrhythmia and you had to perform synchronized cardioversion, it doesn't really matter if you were using a life pack or a Zoll or a Philips, you'll be performing the same procedure and the result of your intervention will be identical. All they really have to explain perhaps is that life pack 12 is a monophasic versus a zone is a biphasic and you have to account for the joules uh, voltage that is inherent between them. However, the principles behind synchronized cardioversion remain the same. On the other hand, whenever you see ventilators being explained, all you really see is people explaining the dials and the switches and nobody wants to focus on fundamental principles behind mechanical ventilation. And if you don't have the fundamental principles behind it, you really don't have understanding of mechanical ventilation. So I really want to remedy that in this presentation and really talk about principles and fundamental basics that govern all mechanical ventilation. Here, we'll mainly focus on invasive mechanical ventilation. And invasive mechanical ve ventilation is conducted via endotracheal tube or a tracheostomy tube. It's a definitive intervention to ensure acceptable oxygenation and ventilation with a secure airway in place. Here in this picture, you see uh, both adjuncts. These are invasive adjuncts and they provide a secure airway. Unlike our normal breathing, which is a negative uh, pressure breathing, whenever a person is placed on mechanical ventilation or you performing a valve valve mask ventilation, it's a positive pressure ventilation. And here we're delivering gas invasively via endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube. In this picture, you see an endotracheal tube being placed in the trachea. And one thing you have to understand here is uh, we are bypassing upper airway. And whenever you're bypassing anatomical structures, there's inherent risks that go along with it and other uh, deleterious effects. So for example, upper airway is used to warm, humidify, and purify air. Here, if you're bypassing that, you have to introduce adjuncts such as heat moisture exchanger in order to accommodate for that. In addition, uh, because it's invasive, we have all types of problems that are associated with that, such as ventilator acquired pneumonia and other complications. And it's really important to understand that whenever you deviate from normal human physiology and introduce uh, something that's super physiological or that goes against uh, normal physiology, you're always going to have uh, 
drawbacks to it. This is the fundamental um, principles that govern all mechanical ventilation you'll see out there. And mechanical ventilation and spread have three main phase variables or three main principles behind them, which are the trigger, the target, and the cycle. And if you really understand these three key phases and the five basic breath types that I'll talk about later, you'll understand most employed modes of mechanical ventilation used in medicine today. And I'll address trigger, target, and cycle one by one. So three main phase variables. We have a trigger, and as the name implies, it's the same thing as a trigger on a gun. If you depress the trigger on the gun, you have the projectile bullet flying out, and this is exactly what happens on the ventilator. A trigger is what causes a breath to be given. And we have two types of triggers. We have a control trigger and we have an assisted trigger. A control trigger is basically an elapsed time uh, that you set on the machine and that governs the trigger uh, of the delivered breath. Patient effort has no input uh, during control trigger. So to give you a quick example, Imagine if I inputted respiratory rate of 12, which equates to one breath every five seconds. So here I have a stopwatch at the bottom. So if I programmed the respiratory rate at 12 and one breath every five seconds, the machine will be programmed to deliver a breath on every marking on the stopwatch. And it doesn't really matter uh, what the patient is doing uh, during the time frame. Uh, the machine is like a factory conveyor belt. And if I set the conveyor belt to make, let's say, 12 stem bottles in one minute, that's what the conveyor belt will do. And it's identical with a control trigger. So a control trigger is governed by elapsed time. In this case, it's being one breath every five seconds or 12 breaths a minute. It's not at all dependent on patient effort. The second type of trigger is an assisted trigger. And an assisted trigger is a signal that results whenever a patient inspiratory effort, which is negative inspiratory force, produces a drop in airway pressure or a diversion of constant gas flow in the ventilator circuitry. So here, as you see, Obama is sucking on the straw. The sucking motion is basically creating a negative inspiratory force. And whenever you conduct that, this will either drop the pressure in the circuit or this will divert flow in the circuit. And whenever flow or pressure is diverted in the circuit, the machine senses that as in, aha, the patient is doing some type of an effort. So now I have to deliver a breath. So an assisted trigger is all governed by patient effort and it's done via drop in flow or drop in uh, pressure in the circuit. Following that, the next phase variable is the target. And the target is our goal. And as the picture shows you, it's what the clinicians are aiming to reach. And there are two types of targets. There's a flow target or there's a pressure target. So this is what I mean by them. First target, we set a flow. And flow are usually associated with volume. So it's a constant flow that I'm delivering in the circuit to the, to the patient. So let's say if I set the flow at 60 liters per minute, it means I'm delivering one liter a second of gas towards the patient. And such that uh, pressure becomes the dependent variable. And you have to monitor peak inspiratory pressures and plateau pressures. So what do I mean by that? So imagine I set the ventilator to deliver a flow targeted uh, breath, which is 60 liters per minute or one liter a second. And the machine is set to that, That's it's constant. So now we'll have this gentleman here and imagine if I'm delivering this flow and now this truck backs up over his chest, right? The machine still is set to deliver 60 liters per minute. It doesn't care that the truck is over his thorax. However, what it will do, it will compress the upper uh, thorax, it will compress the lungs. They become like fibrotic, they become very stiff. So the person uh, loses uh, compliance. So the pressure will rise. Pressure would become the dependent variable. And imagine the following. If the, the guy had a flow uh, targeted breath going to him without the shock, 
he may generate peak inspiratory pressures or plateau pressures that's at 20. However, if the truck is on his chest, the same flow will now have much higher pressures because the chest is now compressed. So you may have pressures in excess of 50 or 60, and this becomes problematic to the lungs because now you're causing uh, damage to the alveoli and uh, you're creating barotrauma and you're creating value trauma. So whenever you're in flow targeted breath, you always want to monitor peak inspiratory pressures and plateau pressures. On the other hand, if we're in pressure targeted uh, mode, flow and volume become the dependent variable. So imagine if I set the pressure, which is constant, such as 20 centimeters of water pressure. Now the ventilator is delivering that 20 centimeters of water pressure uh, to the patient. So now if I have, if I take the same patient and um, now that without the truck on his thorax, with this pressure, let's say the patient is getting uh, 500 of tidal volume at his normal lung compliance. Now that I take this truck and I run it over his thorax, I'm gonna again uh, compress his uh, thorax and compress his lungs. So now at that same pressure of 20 centimeters of water, I'm gonna get much less of a tidal volume delivered. So before, if I delivered 500, with this truck on the chest, I may only be giving 200. So you could see how our minute ventilation will be impacted by that. So whenever you're delivering uh, uh, pressure targeted breath, you always wanna watch the patient's exhaled minute volume and you wanna watch his minute ventilation. So your flow and volume become the dependent variables. And the very easy way to remember these things is you always monitor the opposite of whatever the target is. So for example, if you're in a flow target, you always monitor pressures. And if you're in a pressure target, you always monitor volumes. Our final phase variable is the cycle. And the cycle is what governs uh, the breath to be off. So cycle turns the breath off. This tells the ventilator to stop gas delivery and begin expiration. In cycle, we have three distinct cycling methods, which are set volume, set inspiratory time and decrease in flow rate and what do they all entail so if you were in flow targeted mode whenever a ventilator would reach a set volume of 500 ml the ventilator would signal to stop gas delivery and begin exhalation if you were in pressure targeted mode uh, whenever a ventilator reached an inspiratory time of 0.8 seconds or whatever the clinician has set the ventilator will stop gas delivery and begin exhalation. If you were in pressure support mode, whenever a ventilator sensed a decrease in flow rate in the circuit, it will stop gas delivery and begin exhalation. Thus far, we have discussed three main phase variables, which were the trigger, the target, and the cycle. And following this PowerPoint presentation, I'll have in-person demonstration of what the trigger, the target, and the cycle actually looks like. And I think you need a combination of both PowerPoint presentation to read through the material with an in-person demonstration to really lay down the fundamentals and cement these ideas down. So stay tuned uh, for part two where I explain all these things in person.